Hello everyone, and today's lecture is the dimensions. It's incredible to think that there may be more dimensions than this physical three-dimensional world that we know. But it's even more amazing when we actually are able to investigate this for ourselves and to prove it for ourselves. In this lecture, we'll look at the dimensions and how we are connected to them, and I'll outline a practice to enable us to access each one. Now, obviously, this is a gradual process. We're not going to be able to access them until our psychological work is done on the three-dimensional world. Everything begins in the three-dimensional world. This is where we start our work in the physical world. But you're already starting to get the idea very well now that we are more than the physical body, that we are have more inside us than we realise. I like this particular picture, this image, um, because we spend a lot of time looking outwards to see what are the marvels of nature and, and how can we understand them. And yet, if we were to awaken our consciousness, it is possible for us to investigate all of this phenomenon. We cannot investigate this phenomenon externally speaking, for example, by just simply flying a rocket upwards. We can, however, investigate this phenomenon from our own internal world, our own consciousness, with enough concentration and development is able to investigate these worlds, these superior dimensions. Here's a nice quote from Samuel Anvior. Whosoever awakens consciousness stops dreaming and becomes a competent investigator of the superior worlds. Those are the superior dimensions that we're going to talk about today. Let's also remind ourselves of one of our favourite um, quotations from the Oracle of Delphi. There's a lot in this quotation and we keep returning to it because it's a very inspiring quotation. And the more you study it, the more you realise that there are many clues here in all of the words. So, for example, the secrets of nature. If we want to probe the secrets of nature, which is precisely what we're talking about today, and not only the dimensions, but many other aspects of nature, we have to find them within ourselves. We cannot find them outside. Only within ourselves can we find them. And we can look inside, but we may not find anything except a whole collection of thoughts and emotions and um, disparate uh, fantasies and dreams that we have. But within us is hidden the treasure of treasures. This is the part that we have to access. This conscious part, this essence. Accessing this essence is the one that will enable us to know ourselves and you will know the universe and its gods, as it says. Noske te ipsum means man, know yourself. So following on from last week's talk and the astral dimension, let's have a look at the, the supra dimensions and the infra dimensions. Here we, here we are in the physical world, as we know, and we could say that the supra dimensions are sort of above us, if you like. They are higher. They are the lighter, more spiritual dimensions. These ones are the related to the essence. When our psychology and our consciousness is developed higher, we are able to access these superior dimensions. Connected to the superior dimensions is the infra dimensions. These are the lower dimensions. They're heavier, denser. They are related to the more subconscious regions that we have. They're related to the ego, the infraconscious, we sometimes call it. If ever you notice that you have a very heavy mood or a very heavy um, period of time where you're feeling down or it caught up in, a, uh, in something, then usually we would say that we are in a heavier, denser place, psychologically speaking. When our work is going well, however, and we're remembering ourselves and the dreams are lucid and we have, uh, it is less difficult, shall we say, for us to remember ourselves, then you could say we're, we're in a psychologically in a lighter, a more spiritual place, and this then, of course, is related to the essence. So what are these dimensions? Well, we know the physical world and we speak about the, the physical world as the third dimension because it's made up of height, width and length, the three dimensions. Connected to the physical world is the fourth dimension. And we, we connect the fourth dimension to the physical world because the fourth dimension has to do with time. And uh, everything in the third dimension is subjected to time. Our own physical bodies get old, for example, and nothing lasts forever. 
everything ages and gets old. So the fourth dimension is related to time. We sometimes as well call this dimension the vital world, and I'll talk about that now in the next slide. Uh, the next dimension, the fifth dimension, going up, is the one that we spoke about extensively last week, which is the astral dimension. And also in the fifth dimension, in the upper part of the fifth dimension, is the mental dimension. And if the astral is related to the emotions, the Im mental dimension is related to the thoughts. Now we'll move up to the sixth dimension. The sixth dimension is the causal world, sometimes called the buddhic world, sometimes called the world of cause and effect. It is a highly spiritual dimension. In actual fact, there are certain laws that are associated, or a number of laws that are associated with each dimension. And I'll talk more about this at a later lecture, but just for now, we know that in the third um, dimension, there's 48 laws. In the vital dimension, it's, it's, it can be similar to the astral or similar to the physical. Mostly the vital dimension also has 24 laws. The mental dimension has 12 laws. The causal dimension has six laws. And then the seventh dimension is the spiritual world, the world of the spirit. This has three laws. As you can see, the fewer the laws, the lighter the spiritual level of that dimension, the higher the spiritual dimension, the, the more closer to a higher level of consciousness it is. And in actual fact, there is another world beyond this one. We call it the absolute. And the laws go down there from three to two, to one even. These realms are very high spiritual realms. Let's look at each of these dimensions now in a little bit more depth. Here's the third and the fourth dimension that we spoke of. The third and fourth dimension is related to time. And here we have the physical body, which is the, th the third dimensional side, and the vital body, which is the fourth dimensional side. Somebody who can see the vital body will see it in colours just like this. And um, sometimes people call this the aura, if you like. There is a camera, in actual fact, that has been invented called the Curlian camera, which is able to take photos of the vital aspect of people and things. And so you have here a photo of somebody's hand through using the Curlian camera. And there you can see the vitality um, shining out um, in... in um, in the darkness in this in this photo similarly with the apple and with the leaf now once the apple has died and it's got no vitality in it these little spikes these little um offshoots of energy if you like they they are no longer visible so this is the third and fourth dimensions the physical and the vital bio, vital bodies we know the astral body, we spoke about it quite well last week, and this is where the soul, if you like, can escape from the physical body into the astral dimension. And we gave the practice for that. This is one of the first things that a student of these classes may be able to experience. Even a, a small astral experience will prove to us that we are more than the body and that there are more dimensions other than this physical one. Connected to this dimension is the mental dimension. This is a part of the same dimension, but it is in a, in a higher part. And if we talk about the emotions being related to the astral, then it's the thoughts that are related to the mental. And it's possible for us to investigate both of these dimensions as we develop with our work. The sixth dimension, remember, the world of the causes, the sometimes called the buddhic world. Here's a lovely description from Samuel and Vior of what the causal world is like, and I'll read it to you. In the world of natural causes, life palpitates with intensity. The causal world is beautiful. In the world of natural causes, a profound blue, intense as a night filled with stars and illuminated by the moon, shines constantly. I do not want to say with this that there are no other colours. There are others, but the basic fundamental colour is an intense blue, profound as a bright and starry night. He goes on. The causal world is grandiose, marvellous. In the causal world resound all the harmonies of the universe. In this region, 
one really feels the melodies of the infinite. It happens that each planet has multiple sounds and all of them added together synthesize into a note. This is the keynote of the planet. The conjunction of the keynotes of each world sound marvellously in the immense chorus of the starry space and this produces an ineffable joy in the consciousness of all those beings that enjoy the happiness of the causal world. There are many who have gone before us and have investigated these other dimensions. We are starting off, but there are many who have already completed the journey or who are halfway through it. The world of the spirit is where we find the innermost being, and I've particularly put photos here of the innermost mother. And every culture and every tradition has a representation of this divine female aspect. There are similarly male aspects as well, and the essence is, of, is known as the child of the divine female aspect and divine male aspect. So you could say that we have an inner divine mother and an inner divine father. All of these representations are from cultures that are wildly different, not only in location, but in time as well. Here we have the Indian representation of the innermost mother. And here we have um, the goddess Juno in Greek tradition. This is Tenantzin in the Mayan Aztec times. Here she has the, the, the sun and the moon in her hand. Here we have the goddess Isis wife of Osiris, also again similarly with her arms laid out with wings and symbolising all the benefits and all the bounty that the innermost mother brings. We in the West also have our own representation of the Divine Mother through the Christian tradition, Mary and the, and the baby who is represented there of the essence. And then of course here's the Mona Lisa. Some people say that this photo is the image or the picture of Leonardo da Vinci's own Divine Mother, whom he saw when he investigated in the superior dimensions. Let's have a look now at the practices for each dimension. Here we have the horizontal path, and here we have the vertical path. I'm just going to bring up my pen. Everything starts in the physical. The work that we have starts in the present moment in the physical world. When we learn slowly but surely to remember ourselves, then our level of being starts to improve and starts to go up. And similarly then, as we've said in, in many of the past lectures, our perception of these dimensions grows. And at a certain point, we are able to access these superior dimensions. But we know that the first point of call is that in the physical world is the psychological work. Everything starts in the physical world and this is our home base. This is where we begin. For somebody to awaken in the physical world, it will mean that they have awoken in all of the dimensions. Then there's the vital world. This is the fourth dimension, remember, caught between the astral and the physical. There is a practice to get to this dimension called, called genus, the practice of genus, but that is a, a practice for another day. Then we have astral projection, which we've spoken about quite a lot. And in order to get to the astral projection, in order to get to the next dimension, the mental, we actually have to move from the astral dimension to the mental dimension. And this is called the mental split. Then going up here is the practice of meditation. This is where we can get to in the causal world. I'll bring up my pen again. In the practice of meditation, the essence that we have in the physical is able to escape from the mind, completely free of the mind, no thoughts at all. And then it can go into this causal world this, this, with this meditation practice. In the same way as the astral pro projection practice happens from the physical to the astral, the, men the mental split happens from the astral dimension to the mental dimension. But the meditation practice happens from the physical directly to the causal world. Somebody who has had an experience of meditation never forgets this experience in their whole life because at this point the essence wakes up. It knows its purpose. It knows the truth. It knows the situation it finds itself in 
and it yearns for its development. It yearns to go more and more up this vertical path. For an essence who has experienced meditation, the horizontal path is the school in which it learns, but it is no longer interested in things of the horizontal path. It is only interested in things of the vertical path. And then we have the spiritual dimension, the seventh dimension, and this is where the being is. Any petition that we make from the physical world will go and be heard in the superior dimension. The dimensions are all here and now, interconnected with each other. And a petition properly made, we, when we petition and we listen to ourselves petition, petitioning, that request, that intention goes to that spiritual dimension and is heard. And if it's done properly, then similarly there is strength sent back down to the essence on the physical dimension. We really cannot do without the help that we get from the innermost being. The work is guided and orchestrated, if you like, by the innermost being, by our own being. And the more we connect ourselves to the being, the better it is for us. Because the better then, or the more concrete or the more comprehensive the work is as we go up. We often think that we can do this work alone, but we'll pretty soon run aground. We need the strength from this spiritual dimension. The essence needs to have that, that um, input, that power and the guidance sent down into the physical world. So the work starts in the physical. We must know our own world first in the physical world. We need to know what our psychology is like. We need to know how we work, what are our emotions, what are our feelings, what are our actions. We need to know what it is that keeps us into this physical world. We also need to know what is our level of concentration. Because with the essence scattered like this in all of our activities, it is very, it is impossible, in fact, for us to go to any of those dimensions. Our aim, if we are going to try and go up to the different dimensions, is to gather that essence, to gather it into one point, to make it focused, to make it strong. And this is the first part of the work that we do in this school. We're not going to look at the ego and those heavier dimensions for a long time. Our main piece of work at the moment is going to be dedicated to strengthening and focusing the essence. You've already been doing this with your daily practices, the practice of self-remembrance when you're brushing your teeth or drinking a cup of coffee or walking or getting dressed and so on. All of those little practices, instead of being scattered and thinking about all the different things of the day and all the fantasies that we may have, we're learning to bring our essence to a point of focus. And this is what we call concentration. Concentration is a key practice. We cannot get anywhere in this work without concentration. Now, you, as I've said, you've already been doing practices of concentration with those daily activities. And we need to keep those going. We need to keep those up. But it will speed up if we learn to practice on an object as well, in a kind of a sit-down practice. So we have the sort of the sit-down practices and we also have then the daily tasks and I'll just represent that by a cup if you like. So the sit-down task would be where we practice on an object and the daily tasks would be say drinking a cup of coffee for example. Now if we have an element of strength when we're practicing the, the coffee then we take that strength with us to the sit down practices. But when we sit down and we concentrate on an object, then we get more strength very in a very fast, short period of time. And we bring that strength back to the daily exercises. It's a mutually beneficial arrangement. Short concentration practices on an object definitely improve our ability to remember ourselves during the practices of the daily tasks when we are trying to apply willpower and perception. Let's have a look. The energy that's created is an awesome power for us. Without it, nothing can be achieved. Practices become ineffective, progress slow and energy dissipated. And I really like this picture here because it shows that when the sunlight comes and is focused, it has a real power. That is the power that we will have to be able to investigate any of these dimensions and of course our own psychology and anything that we need to know <clears throat> in this work, we can investigate it if we are focused. If we are not focused, we're too scattered 
we're over the place, just like we said before. We're all over the place here. But when we learn to focus, then our essence becomes very strong. So how do we do this practice of concentration on an object? So first of all, this is us, the subject. And we can sit down in a comfortable chair, a comfortable armchair, however we, we like to do that, or we can sit cross-legged on the floor if we prefer. But place in front of you an object, and it can be any object. In this case, we've, we've chosen an orange, but it could be a plant or a candle, a glass of water, um, anything like that. And our aim is to concentrate on this, ob on this object using those two aspects that we call will and perception. So let's have a look. We're going to look at, the, look at the, the orange. That is our will. That is our action. Now we're going to know that we're looking. We're going to know and perceive that we're looking. That is our perception. And it's using, in this case, the sense of sight. Now it's important to keep the eyes open during this practice and to maintain a, a sense of, of relaxation with the body. In fact, it's best to do this practice when you feel a willingness to do it and when your inner state is in a very positive place. And so feeling with a positive inner state and with a relaxed body, make a petition and ask for help to your innermost being, to that superior part within us, for help to, of guidance to do this practice and strength as well. And then proceed. Number one, look. Number two, know we're looking. And what you're interested in is the subject. It's ourselves. If you like, you can almost imagine the orange within us. The orange is there. Our concentration is more to do with us than it is to do with the object over here. We want to hold our attention on that one thought, which is the object. What will happen, of course, is that thoughts will come along, um, idle thoughts, they will come along into our mind and they will come along at regular intervals. Ignore them because for, our, for this period of time, for five to ten minutes or however long, we have chosen to practice, to exercise concentration. Our aim is to concentrate ourselves in this point, not to go along with the thoughts. So in this regard, what we want to do is make sure that the line that we have between ourselves and the orange is a fixed line. It's stable. It's solid. It's not going to be broken up by any thoughts. Imagine a kind of a, uh, a piece of string, if you like, between you and the object. And that piece of string has to maintain its tension. Any time a thought comes along, what's happening is, is it's breaking that tension and spoiling our concentration. When this happens, address the thought, look at it and say, is this useful to me or not? My purpose was to concentrate. My purpose is not to think. You see, our mind is used to thinking whenever and wherever it likes on whatever topic. With concentration, we're now bringing it more into focus. This is the focus of the essence. These two actions here, the will and the perception, are using qualities of the essence. They're bringing them into play. It is the essence that we're concentrating um, within our minds. And concentrating the essence within our minds requires effort because the mind has always been used to having its own way. It's quite interesting if you think physically speaking, we know, for example, if we're going to go somewhere, if I'm going to go to the bank or if I'm going to go to work, I go there and I know exactly what I'm doing. But when we sit down to do a practice of concentration on an object, our mind doesn't remember for half a minute, maybe even less, that that's what it's intended to do. This is part of our training. We've got to train ourselves to look, to know we are looking, and to remember that that's what we're doing. In the early days, you can actually say this to yourself. I am looking. I know I'm looking. And try and remember that that's what you're doing. Only for a short period of time. These short practices are really of, of great benefit to our daily tasks. And you will notice that there will be a certain strength when you finish the practice even five to ten minutes, and you can increase it slowly, slowly every day. <clears throat> but if you learn to do these practices every day, 
then the concentration of the essence will start to grow. So now you know what your homework is. Try concentration on an object every day. Vary the objects, vary the times. But remember, always go in when you're feeling in a good place, with a good inner state, um, a positive inner state. And use this practice then to refresh your daily activities. How is your attention, for example, your remembrance? When you're eating breakfast, or when you are doing the dishes, or when you're boiling the kettle, or when you're hoovering. All of those physical daily tasks are always, they're, they're very good to start with these tasks. Now there is a study, uh, there is a, a video lecture called The Power of Concentration. Study that lecture as well. It'll give some useful tips and it's always inspiring to hear why we need concentration and to hear again how to do it. This lecture will concentrate on how to use concentration during the daily tasks. We've also provided you with a handout of the practice, note by note, step by step. So use this uh, handout in conjunction with this lecture. And as ever, any questions or any comments, email us at info at htsk.ie.